Gala Elwa was a Russian exile who became the chief muse of the surrealist group. Her independent mind and critical tongue had influenced others in the group before Dali. Gala was to dominate Dali's life as no other obsession could. He even began to sign his paintings, Gala Dali. Gala was the rock which saved him from madness, and she devoted the rest of her life to promoting his career as an artist. Eloard elegantly decided to return to Paris alone and went off with his friends. In September of that year, 1929, I remained alone with Gala. My passion grew daily, the more so since Gala changed her clothes three times a day, and at each meeting I rediscovered her anew. Without love, without Gala, I would no longer be Dali. She is my blood, my oxygen. My family could not understand why I should be obsessed with another man's wife. I received a letter from my father notifying me of my irrevocable banishment from the bosom of my family. When I received this letter, my first reaction was to cut off all my hair. But I did more than this. I had my head completely shaved. I went and buried the pile of my black hair in a hole I had dug on the beach for this purpose. Then I climbed up on a small hill from which one overlooks the whole village of Caracas. And there, sitting under the olive trees, I spent two long hours contemplating that panorama of my childhood, of my adolescence, and of my present. This historical moment, the most tragical and pathetic of my daily life, the moment of my family, expels Dali of the family because belief Catali and Gala is two people completely crazy. But one statement is necessary. The only difference between one crazy man and Dali is very simple. Dali is not crazy at all. Our lack of money was another of Gala's and my secrets. We still had almost nothing. We were living constantly among the richest people and were constantly anguished over money. But we knew that our strength was never to show it, for the pity of the neighbour kills. Strength, said Gala, lay in inspiring not pity but shame. We could have died of hunger and no one would ever have known it. We made it a point of honour never to let our material difficulties be known. As soon as the money began to diminish, the first precautionary measure we took was to give bigger tips wherever we went. The paintings that Dali had been working on when he returned to Spain were regarded as a breakthrough by the Surrealists. They felt that he portrayed the elusive world of the subconscious more imaginatively than any of his contemporaries. His methods were strongly influenced by the ideas of Freud, and André Breton championed him as the new prophet of Surrealist painting. However, it wasn't long before the persistence of some of Dali's obsessions caused Breton to have misgivings. Si me encuentro que Breton es el burgués más burgués que existe porque eh, dudaba de exponer un cuadro mío porque había un señor que tenía los calzoncillos cagados. O sea, fíjese, bueno, ellos que tenían que transcribir exactamente lo que se sueña o lo que pasa por la cabeza sin ninguna represión de la conciencia ni de la moral ni de nada, pues encontraba que no era correcto que se hubiera cagado en los, en los calzoncillos. Entonces yo, como que era el más surrealista de todos, hasta el punto de dar una patada o tuba a un, a un uh, ciego, como hablamos, porque para mí lo más repugnante es esos ciegos que se sonríen y que, porque se creen ciegos, hacen así para que se les haga pasar por la calle. Entonces, Yo me repugnó tanto que le di una patada al culo y se fue a caer al otro lado de la... Entonces yo hacía actos realmente surrealistas. 
A great deal of my prestige among the Surrealists came from the dinner invitations I received. As soon as the arguments at the Place Blanche became heated, and I was no longer the centre of attraction, I would get up and say, you'll have to excuse me, I'm expected at a dinner. And I always made sure the next day that my little friends getting along on sardines and bread crusts knew that I had eaten oysters the night before at a prince's table. I saw in a small gallery in Paris a picture which I liked, which was by Daddy. And a uh, short time later, uh, a writer friend of mine called René Crevel was a friend of the Daddy, so he introduced me to them. And from then onwards, my wife and I, and I saw a lot of the Daddies. They used to come and stay with my wife and me in the south of France. And one day, uh, Gala uh, said to me, uh, we have our financial position is very difficult. We've got great a difficulty in making ends meet, and I don't want a daddy to commercialize himself. So, if we could find a certain number of people who would ensure my idea would be that uh, 12 people each would ensure a mens eventuality to, uh, uh, to a daddy, and like that, we'd have no, we'd have no more difficulty, could work quietly. And I found a certain amount of people. One was Emilio Terry, the architect, another one was the Vicomte, Vicomte Vicomtesse de Noy, who to whom I introduced Daddy, which was very um, beneficial to him because they bought a lot of his work and helped him a lot. And the others I don't quite remember anymore, but those were the main ones. We were 12, and the counterpart that every month we received either a painting or drawings that Daddy or etching that Daddy had made, and then we all met together for dinner on the 23rd of December, and that lasted till the war in the Daddy studio, and a picture was auctioned off after dinner, and the one that's back of me uh, here is uh, one of those that I won at, uh, at, the Christmas, at the Christmas auction. We were to go to a moving picture with some friends, and at the last moment I decided not to go. Gala would go with them, and I would stay home and go to bed early. We had topped off our meal with a very strong camembert, and after everyone had gone, I remained for a long time, seated at the table, meditating on the philosophic problems of the super soft, which the cheese presented to my mind. I got up and went into my studio, where I lit the light in order to cast a final glance, as is my habit, at the picture I was in the midst of painting. This picture represented a landscape near Port Legat, whose rocks were bathed in a transparent and melancholy twilight. In the foreground, an olive tree with its branches cut and without leaves. I knew that the atmosphere which I had succeeded in creating with this landscape was to serve as a setting for some idea, for some surprising image, but I did not in the least know what it was going to be. I was about to turn out the light when instantaneously I saw the solution. I saw three soft watches, one of them hanging lamentably on the branch of the olive tree. When Gala returned from the theatre, the picture was completed. I made her sit down in front of it with her eyes shut. One, two, three, open your eyes. I looked intently at Gala's face and I saw upon it the unmistakable contraction of wonder and astonishment. I asked her, do you think that in three years he will have forgotten this image? No one can forget it once he has seen it, she said. 